All right, well, if you would open with me to John chapter 20. I'm going to preach this morning uh, from the, the theme verse for Vacation Bible School. Um, and again, the, uh, the name for Vacation Bible School this, uh, this year is Encounters with Jesus. And so that's what I've titled this sermon as well. Encounters with Jesus. Have you ever thought about how incredible it would be to, to uh, teleport to first century Israel and have a flesh and blood encounter with Jesus? That would be pretty incredible, wouldn't it? To see him there in the flesh in first century Israel. Um, Twelve years ago, I had the uh, privilege to go to 21st century Israel. And uh, I didn't see Jesus there, but I did get to see many of the places uh, where he ministered. And, uh, and so that was a pretty cool experience uh, to go and to see these places. But of course, none of these places would have any meaning at all if we didn't have the gospel accounts that have been passed on to us that, that tell us of Jesus's ministry and, and what he did in these specific places. And so really the next best thing to having a flesh and blood encounter with Jesus is, is reading of those encounters in the Bible, in the gospels. And, and God has been gracious to inspire and preserve for us not one, not two, not three, but four gospel accounts. These are ancient Greco-Roman biographies of the person Jesus of Nazareth. And, and we're going to be in the Gospel of John this morning. That is where this theme verse for VBS is found. Uh, that verse is John uh, 20, verse 31, the, the final verse of this chapter says this, but these are written, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So what we're going to do is we're going to back up all the way to verse 24 for, for some context here, uh, but I really am going to focus on at least the latter part of this passage. Um, now, of course, believer, as, as believers, when we read the Bible, we don't just read it simply as uh, a book or even simply as an ancient Greco-Roman biography. We realize that it is even more than that, that this is uh, inspired by God. And, and as Christians, we rely on the Holy Spirit to illumine the text for us, to, to penetrate our hearts. And so, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to read the text as we always do, and then we're going to pray uh, to that end that the Spirit would, would aid us. And so would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? And I'm going to begin in verse 24. Uh, this is a, a familiar story to you, I'm sure, of, of Thomas and his encounter with Jesus uh, after the resurrection. And, uh, and it's on the tail end of this that we have uh, uh, the verse that we just read. So verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand, uh, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this account, and we thank you for these wonderful words, these words of promise, these words of life. We pray that um, you will uh, illumine this text for us, that you will penetrate our hearts uh, with your word by your spirit. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, in our main verse, there in verse 30, when it says these are written, or these things are written so that you may believe, um, what is it referring to here? Uh, well, well, of course, in the immediate context, what John himself is referring to is 
uh, these signs, right? He, he says that many other signs were performed that were not written in this book, but the ones that were written in this book, they were written for a reason. They were written so that you may believe, and so that by believing you may have life in his name. And so John, when he, when he talks about these things that were written, these that were written, he's talking about uh, these signs. And in fact, throughout the book of John, I actually did a sermon series on this uh, a year or so ago, the, the signs, uh, which are just miracles, it's what John calls these miracles of Jesus, uh, we see many of them scattered throughout the book of John that kind of make up some of, some of the framework of this gospel. And so he's saying that, that the reason these things are recorded, these signs, these miracles, these encounters with Jesus, the reason is, is so that you may believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you may have life in his name. Okay, so that's just uh, important for us to understand what's being referred to there in, in that uh, key verse. And uh, uh, I will say, though, that uh, for, for VBS, for those of you who are helping with VBS or you have your kids coming to VBS, uh, it's, it's kind of expanding the application of this passage because uh, we're going to be looking in, in many different Gospels and in all kinds of encounters, some of them miraculous, and, and, uh, but, but really just encounters with Jesus in general throughout the Gospels. And, and, and that is applicable, uh, even though John maybe had these certain things in mind. It, it's true that when we look at all the Gospels, we see these encounters with Jesus. Why were they recorded? Well, they were recorded so that we may believe, so that in believing we may have life in his name. Okay, so so uh, for this sermon, there's going to be three headings. The first is the nature of Christian belief. The second is the content of Christian belief. And then the third is the reward of Christian belief. So that is what this is all about, about Christian belief, about believing, um, about the purpose of these accounts. Uh, they were written so that we would believe and, and so that we might have life in believing. Okay, so first, the nature of Christian belief. Christian belief... It is faith. Okay? It is faith. We often talk about the Christian faith, right? And so, so on one hand, it's important for us to recognize that there is a faith element. But also what I want to point out as we look at this passage is that uh, Jesus is not calling us to have blind faith. Okay? So the nature of Christian belief is that it is, it is faith, but it is not blind faith. Okay? Um, I've, I've pointed out a number of times, I think, uh, and preaching and teaching that actually in, in our English Bibles, the word belief, faith, trust, or different forms of those words is actually all the same word in Greek. It's the word pistis, okay? Uh, so, 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 so to believe, to have faith, same thing, right? Your, your English translations might, uh, might uh, use different words at different times, but it's the same Greek word behind that. It's the same concept, and so it's, and it is, it's even true for us, even as we think of um, uh, the, the, way that, the way that we come to believe things. The fact is that everything that we believe has some level of faith or trust. Um, so we might, we might tend to separate those words, uh, but, but really it's, it's, it's all the same, right? We believe something because we we trust whether, our, whether it's our senses or our memory or historical records or some kind of evidence um, that there's some kind of element of faith involved. If we want to get really philosophical, uh, we could uh, talk about Descartes and how he says, you know, the only thing we could be sure of is I think, therefore I am, right? That's, that's the one thing we can know for certain. But then everything else requires some level of faith. Some, again, whether we're trusting our senses or historical records or, or whatever, the, our memory, whatever it might be, okay? So that's true in our day-to-day -day life, and that's true when it comes to, uh, to the Christian faith, right? We have good reason to believe, uh, but nevertheless, uh, we're having to trust, in this case, uh, historical documents. And there's more to it than that, and we'll kind of we'll, we'll, uh, flesh that out as, as we go on. Now, naturally, um, what we can perceive directly with our senses is going to require less faith, right? Um, that's why they say that seeing is believing so if you're not sure about something, you want to see it for yourself, right? Uh, so for example, just the other day, uh, the kids and I were in the woods, and, and Caleb, he said, he said, Dad, there's a, there's a spider there as big as my hand. And, and my response was, no way, let me see, let me see. And sure enough, it, it was a big spider. It wasn't quite as big as, as his hand. You know, nine-year-olds, I guess, have the tendency to exaggerate a little bit. Um, but, but I wanted to see it, right? Whenever you're not so sure about something, you want to see it. Uh, and so when we, when we directly perceive something with our senses, 
Now, that does require less faith. But again, I would say even that, uh, you know, we're trusting in our senses. Our senses can sometimes deceive us, can't they? So, so everything requires some level of faith. But it is true that um, what we perceive directly with our senses require less faith. And that's why Thomas wanted to see the risen Jesus, right? Um, so, so what does Thomas say? Uh, the second part of verse 25, he says, um, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. So he, he, had, he wanted to not only see, but also feel. And he wanted to touch, right? Uh, and so, you know, and we give Thomas a hard time, but that's a lot to process, right? Um, and, and, and plus, you know, all the other disciples had seen Jesus and he had not yet seen Jesus. And so, and so uh, he does make this demand and uh, Jesus makes him wait a little while, eight days, but, but Jesus graciously um, does reveal himself to Thomas. Okay? So, um, and then here, here's, what, uh, here's what Jesus says after he reveals himself to Thomas. He says, this is verse 29, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so this is, of course, you and me, those who have not seen, right? Uh, we have not seen the risen Christ. We have not directly perceived him with our senses. And so Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so Jesus does push up against this, the whole seeing is believing motto. And, and, and rightfully so. I, I mean, you know, I, I notice oftentimes skeptics of the Christian faith, they will demand such a high degree of evidence for the claims of Jesus, but they don't they won't demand that same degree of evidence when it comes to other historical things or, 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 or many of the things that they believe, right? We believe all kinds of things that we don't directly perceive with our senses. Um, but but uh, but uh, we uh, we might have this um, I think largely due to our sin. Sometimes we have uh, a, a a lack of faith that that borders on the extreme skepticism, or at least we see this with, uh, with unbelievers often, that, that they, they, want to, they, want to, they want to up the ante. They're always up in it. Okay, well, you know, Jesus wrote, wrote something in the clouds that, that, that he was the Christ. Then I would believe. Well, if it happened, they'd probably say it was you know, some kind of odd phenomenon. And then they would require more and more. And so that's, that's often how it goes. Uh, but I, I digress. Um, here, here's, here's the point. Um, Jesus, he, he, he pushes up against this scene as believing. He says, blessed are those who, who have not seen and yet believe. And so he calls for faith. But as we read on the passage, we see that Jesus is not calling for blind faith. He's not calling for blind faith. Um, that is to say, we have to be careful to recognize that um, you know, having not seen is not equal to having no evidence or reason. Um, if, if you can't tell by now, this is going to be somewhat of an apologetic sermon. You guys know I, I like apologetics, um, but, but I think this is very relevant because, again, we see in this passage that, that, that uh, uh, John is saying that these things are written so they should be believed. Right? We're, we're given a reason to believe. We're given evidence. Um, so, so even though we don't perceive the risen Christ directly with our senses, as, as Thomas had the privilege of doing, he says, blessed are those who believe even though they have not seen. Um, but again, this is not, this is not blind faith. Just because we don't perceive with our physical eyes doesn't mean that there's no uh, evidence of reason. That's often what people mean when they say blind faith. They say, oh, you don't have any good reason at all to believe it. You just believe it because you want to believe it. Uh, that, that, is not, um, that is not what the Bible sets out for us uh, for the Christian faith. The passage continues. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Okay, so, so, this, so this charge, this charge that Christianity is, is just blind faith, that's something that we ought to reject. Because sometimes, I think even Christians might, might somewhat kind of give in to that and say, well, I just believe, I just believe. Well, no, the Bible itself gives us good reasons to believe. Um, uh, you know, one, one thing that really sets Christianity apart from all other religions 
is that it, is not, it does not ultimately hinge upon uh, some kind of private divine encounter uh, by some self-proclaimed prophet. You know, so think about Muhammad in a cave, right, ha have, have, having these, uh, these revelations, and you just have to trust him on it, right? That, 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 that's not how it is in Christianity. Christianity doesn't depend upon these kinds of private things, but instead, Christianity hinges on very public, a very public ministry of miracles, and ultimately a resurrection with 40 days of post-resurrection appearances. Um, uh, you know, th these were things that happened in the public and, and, and the writers of the Gospels and the book of Acts were bold enough to write it just as it happened to their contemporaries because it was true. There, there, there wasn't, uh, they weren't going to be um, uh, questioned about these accounts it, it, or, or at least they weren't going to be embarrassed by what they wrote because um, it, it, uh, there was um, uh, evidence for it. Uh, they had seen these things with their own eyes. And not only the disciples themselves, but it, it, this was uh, well known, you know, all of these events. I think of Acts 26, 26, when Paul uh, says this concerning King Agrippa. He says, I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. Right, that, that, that's, that's a pretty cool phrase there in Acts, right? He's, he's saying, hey, King Agrippa, uh, he, he knows I'm not crazy because these things, they haven't happened in the corner, right? Um, everybody knows about Jesus and his ministry. Everybody knows about these appearances uh, after his crucifixion. Everybody knows about these things. It's not done in a corner. It was a public thing. So Christianity hinges on these public things. And, and, and these, these public things, these encounters, these encounters with Jesus... Uh, they have been preserved for you and me via the many eyewitness testimonies that make up the New Testament. And, uh, and these testimonies are consistent. They're compelling. And the truth of these testimonies, it really is the only good explanation for the rise of Christianity. And so, so this, this is just a good faith builder. It's something important for us as Christians to think about. But also, if you are engaging with, with an unbeliever, um, just ask why, why do you think that uh, under severe persecution that there were thousands of people um, in the beginning? These, these were thousands of, of Jews who, who radically changed their understanding of things and, and, and were willing to be killed for their belief that this man rose from the dead. I think they just kind of made it up and said, oh, let's, let's, let's die for this. And, 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 and just that the thousands of people, this explosion of Christianity in, 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 the, in first century Israel and then spreading that throughout the ends of the earth, uh, there, there was something that, that, that caused this, right? It, it, at least, at, least that they, at the very least, thought that they had seen something. Um, and uh, and when, you, when you stack it all up, uh, there's, there's really no good explanation for the rise of Christianity than, than the fact that, that these claims really are true. That these things really did happen. Uh, whether we're talking about Jesus' ministry of miracles or this ultimate miracle of his resurrection. And so these, these things, they were written uh, to give us good reason to believe, right? Th these were written so that you may believe that he's the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing you may have life in his name. Okay? And so, uh, so, so the Bible itself... You know, especially when you think of the New Testament, the New Testament is really a collection of documents. It's not just one book. It's, it's many books. It's many testimonies. And, um, and it, it, it itself uh, serves as uh, good evidence for um, Christianity. So, um, so that's, why, that's why John says these things were written. Uh, these miracles, it's not, it's not just so that we can see like, oh, that's really cool. Um, but but it's, it's so that we don't have to read it. So he may have life in his name. And then, of course, there is uh, the, the more personal spiritual side to all of this. Because, of course, the work of the Holy Spirit is real. Right? And so, so most of us, we came to faith uh, probably not because you, you uh, painstakingly went through the New Testament and, 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 and tested all of its claims. And then, now that is true for some people. At least that's, that's, that's something key that God uses in their lives. Uh, right? You might think of like Lee Strobel. Uh, he, was, he was a... Uh, um, uh, a, a writer for the Chicago Tribune, and he was an atheist, and uh, he decided that he was going to prove Christianity wrong, and so he, he went through uh, these claims of the New Testament, and then ultimately he was convinced that it was true. So you see that kind of story with many people, but oftentimes uh, you, we just have a kind of encounter with Jesus ourselves, right? With, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, God, God changes our hearts, and, and uh, the, the Holy Spirit testifies to the truth of Scripture, and that's, and that's legit, 
right? Uh, you, you, don't, you don't have to um, uh, be a detective or, or some kind of scholar uh, to come to faith because uh, there is this spiritual side to it. But really, both sides are important. It's important that we have that spiritual certainty, uh, that we have this, the, the Holy Spirit testifying to us the truth of the Gospels. Uh, but it is important as Christians that, that, we, uh, that we continue to, uh, to look at the New Testament and, and see the, uh, um, the historical veracity of it, that, that it really um, is, is uh, giving us uh, true historical accounts, and there's good reason to believe that. And so when we combine uh, this work of the Holy Spirit and then this, the full scope of historical evidence preserved for us, we can both know and show our faith uh, with, with a great deal of confidence, even though we ourselves have not seen Right. So again, Jesus is pushing against this seeing is believing. He's saying, you know, there are going to be people who come along, Thomas, uh, who come along after you. They're not going to have the privilege of, of seeing me risen from the dead and, and, and perhaps even sticking their hand into my side. Um, but uh, blessed are those who believe, even though they have not seen. Uh, because uh, my miracles and, and the testimony to my resurrection, all of these, all of these things are going to be preserved in the scriptures. That's what John himself is writing, and he says the reason for this is to give us uh, this good reason to believe. Okay, so that's the nature of Christian faith. Uh, it, it, it is a, a, a nature of Christian belief. Right? It is faith, but it's not blind faith. Uh, but now, now let's talk about the content of Christian belief. Christian belief is belief in both a proposition and a person. So the proposition is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Okay? Uh, now the word Christ is the Greek word Christos, which is uh, it, it's the Greek for Messiah. Right? So, so this is um, belief that Jesus is the Messiah. Now do you realize that the, the fact that Jesus died, much less the fact that he died this humiliating death on a cross, but just the fact that Jesus died, period, that, that it automatically disqualified him as the Messiah according to Jewish expectations. Right? The, the Jews during Jesus' time did not expect the Messiah to die. Let me give you an example. Uh, there were actually many people before and after Jesus, kind of hovering around that time period, there were many people who claimed to be the Messiah. And there were movements you know, among different sects of Jews that, that, that believed that some person was the Messiah. Then that person would die, and the movement would die. Because the Messiah wasn't supposed to die according to their understanding. So one uh, specific example, Bar Kokhba, uh, in, in the year 132, um, there were many Jews who hailed him as the Messiah. They even minted coins in his honor with a rebuilt temple. And they, and they numbered, uh, for three years, they made these coins, and they numbered them year one, year two, year three. I mean, in their mind, this, 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 this was, this was um, well, just you know, think about how, how our calendar is now based on the birth of Christ. Well, well, for them, they're thinking, okay, this, this Messiah, Bar Kokhba, um, he, he has come and he's brought something new. And so uh, year one, year two, year three. And, and, and they had this great confidence that he was the Messiah. But then in the year 135, just a few years later, he was killed by the Romans. And the movement died, as all others did. But the thing with Jesus is, when Jesus died, that was just the beginning and why is it? Well, it's because Jesus was raised from the dead. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, well, as they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, it began to make sense of, of a lot of things in the Old Testament that maybe didn't make so much sense to the Jewish people at the time. For example, these suffering servant prophecies, right? Because uh, the Old Testament says that the Messiah is going to be this great king. Uh, and so we know Jesus is coming again, and that right, right now he's even at the right hand of the Father. But when he comes again, he's going to come in great power and glory. So that made sense to them. But these suffering servant things about him um, being pierced for our transgressions, right? Even this explicit language about the crucifixion in Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. What in the world does that mean? They didn't understand it. But now that Jesus has been crucified and risen, uh, these, these suffering servant prophecies, Psalm 22, my goodness, it gives this clear, this clear picture of the crucifixion. Um, and, and, and we think of uh, other prophecies in the Old Testament. They suddenly made sense now that Jesus had been crucified and risen. And so uh, 
that was just the beginning, right? And so, so many others began to join this movement. It spread like wildfire because Jesus was not like these other people who claimed to be the Messiah. Jesus rose from the dead and it changed everything. And of course, Jesus' ministry of miracles, all of these encounters with Jesus that we see in the New Testament, they testify that he is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. Uh, so Isaiah 35, 5 through 6, the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Right? So, so Jesus performed these kinds of miracles in his ministry, even before this ultimate miracle of the resurrection. And so, again, what does John say about all this? He says that, that, that these are written, these things are written so that you might believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. All right, so the content of Christian belief, again, is what we're talking about now. I shall overlap here, though, isn't there? Uh, but the content it is this proposition. Uh, first of all, we see it's a proposition that Jesus is the Christ, that he is indeed the Messiah. He's not like these others who had claimed to be the Messiah, um, but he is risen, and he is... Uh, coming again. So Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. So that's part of it. Uh, but more than just a proposition, uh, the content of Christian belief is, is, is belief in a person. All right, we don't just simply believe things about Jesus, but we believe in him. There's, there's a, again, a personal element to this. And so, so let's just think about Thomas in, in, in this very uh, account. Thomas, he does not simply come to believe something about Jesus, right? It's not like he says, oh, well, I guess they're right. Jesus, you rose from the dead. How about that? He, he doesn't just, he doesn't simply believe the proposition. He does believe that, um, but, but it's more personal to him. What does he say in uh, uh, verse 28? He says, my Lord and my God, right? That's, that's more than just a proposition. He's, he's taking ownership of this. Uh, he, he's saying, my Lord, my God. He's believing in a person. This is key because, um, you know, our country is filled with people who believe certain things about Jesus, but don't believe in him. And that's such a dangerous, dangerous place to be. Right? There are many, many people who call themselves Christians because they say, oh, yeah, I believe this, I believe that. And, but but they, don't, they don't really believe in Jesus. They, they, they can maybe say, okay, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. Maybe they would say Jesus is the Christ. But can, can they say, my Lord and my God? That's, that's the question. And, uh, you know, I suspect that, that there are uh, even, even some here this morning who are, who are in that boat, right? You believe the right things about Jesus. You believe the propositions but do you really believe, do you really trust in the person? Can you say, my Lord and my God, like Thomas did? You know, that's, that's really where the true faith is. When we talk about the Christian faith, yes, as I said before, you know, all, all beliefs uh, take some measure of faith, right? Uh, we have to trust in something. And so, yes, it takes a measure of faith to believe the testimonies about Jesus, but I don't think that's really what takes all that much faith. What, what really takes faith is, is, to, is to say, Jesus, I'm yours. Jesus, you, you are my Lord and my God, and I am in submission to you. I trust you with my life. That's, that's where the true faith is, okay? So, so, so don't say you have faith just if you maybe simply believe some propositions. Yeah, you have some measure of faith, but, uh, but you've but you got to trust in, you've got to believe in the person of Jesus. And that's where, that's where, true faith, Christian faith is. That's where the rubber meets the road. And so we have to ask ourselves that question, right? Do I just believe some things about Jesus or do I believe in Jesus? Do I trust in Jesus? We ask ourselves that and, and we have to, uh, you know, when we're talking with, with our unbelieving neighbors, family members or whatever, when, when, when we're engaging in evangelism, uh, we've got we've to make sure that people uh, realize that, you know, just if, if they simply can check off some, some facts that they believe, you know, the demons, they believe God is one and they tremble. The demons, they know Jesus rose from the dead. They were there, right? So the demons, they, they, they know all these facts, but it's about your attitude and your disposition towards God, towards Christ. Is he your Lord and your God, right? We've got to press that. I've heard, I've heard people say, you know, half of the difficulty, difficulty of evangelism is convincing someone they're not a Christian in the first place. That's especially true in, 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 uh, in our part of the country, in other parts of the country, you know, where, where maybe it's a status quo to be a Christian. They say, oh, yeah, I was raised in church, or yeah, I believe this and that, I'm a Christian. Uh, well, you've you got to convince them that, that, that 
No, is, is Jesus really your Lord and your God? That's, that's where it is. It's believing in a person. So it's crucial that we move beyond propositions. Of course, the propositions are important, uh, but we've got to go even further and believe in, trust in the person of Jesus. And so, uh, you know, I've heard many testimonies from uh, some people I know personally and others that I've just uh, read or heard, or heard elsewhere. You know, unbelievers, uh, they'll say that they just picked up a New Testament and they began to read and then they say, I fell in love with the person of Jesus. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. So, of course, yeah, it's, it's important that, that, that you believe these things, that you believe that he was who he said he was, uh, these miracles really happened, that Jesus really rose from the dead. That's all important. But, but what about the person of Jesus? Uh, again, that's where the rubber meets the road. So the content of Christian belief is both in a proposition and a person. And so we see that in our text. We see that, uh, yes, we, these things are written so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It's the proposition. Uh, but, uh, but we see in the example of Thomas that it's more than that. Uh, my Lord and my God, trusting in Jesus, taking him as our own. All right, so finally, this last one will be more brief. Um, the reward of Christian belief. And so we, we've said it again and again as, as I've quoted the passage, right? These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So life, that's the reward of Christian belief, that we have life in Jesus' name. And so remember what Jesus said to Thomas. He said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Well, why? Again, he's talking about you and me, right? Because we have not seen Jesus in the flesh. Why are we blessed if we believe? Well, we're blessed if we believe because in believing we have life in his name. Isn't that incredible? Um, life. That, that's a you know, huge theme in the Gospel of John. Just let me kind of um, quickly run through um, many of the high points here. Uh, as far as, as, far as uh, life is concerned here in the book of John. Uh, John 1, 4. <clears throat> in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And then we jump forward to John chapter 4, and that's in John chapter 4, it's when Jesus has the encounter with the woman at the well. And, and, and what does, what does uh, Jesus offer to her? He offers himself as living water, right? He says, he says I have this living water, will you never be thirsty again? Uh, then John 5, 25, Jesus makes this bold pronouncement. He says, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear him will live. John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come, says Jesus, I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. John eleven twenty five, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then finally, our passage this morning. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so those are just, that's just a handful of places in John where we see this theme of life. And so, of course, this is referring to eternal life um, uh, that, that goes on forever. Uh, but in a very real sense, it begins in the here and now for those who believe. And so there is a quality, there's a quantity to this, right? Uh, that is, it goes on forever, but it's also speaking of a quality of existence. I especially think of John 10, 10. I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full, have it abundantly. And so, so it, it begins even in the here and now. So ask yourself this question as we come to a close. And I can't believe that I have not tripped and fallen on my face. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen me uh, um, stumbling over this, but I told them, I, I, I said, hey, I can handle it. If I fall, it'll just be good entertainment. Um, uh, but, uh, but as we come to your close, ask yourself this question. Uh, do, do you have this life, this life that is mentioned again and again, this life that comes through believing? Now, understand that it doesn't mean, you know, to, to have a life in Christ, it doesn't mean that everything is... Uh, rainbows and unicorns doesn't mean that everything is perfect in your life, right? Uh, we face many troubles. The New Testament is clear on that. But what it does mean is that you're no longer dead in your sins. And it means that you have a hope, 
the hope for the full and final redemption of your body and soul when Christ returns. Uh, it means that you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, uh, that, that, is, that is giving you this, this spiritual life, and you are uh, being formed into the image of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So do you have that life? We see in the text this morning that the path to this life is belief. Right? It's, it's not getting your act together, picking up yourself by your own bootstraps. It's not any of those things, but, but the path to this life is belief in Jesus. Belief in the testimony about Jesus. So yes, the proposition, right? believing in the proposition, but ultimately it is belief in a person who has given us every reason to embrace him as our Lord and our God. Let's pray together.